terms of economic growth and performance in the past few decades. Uh, if you look at the right hand side graph, uh, this is uh, from uh, an economist called Bob Gordon, who essentially showed that the rate of economic growth in the US has slowed down significantly from like the golden age of the 50s of about 3.5% of TFP growth uh, to essentially less than 1%, a bit, a bit, a bit above half a percent, uh, like in past, in, in past years. And this has been really troubling to many economists from the West. Uh, and this figures, you know, uh, this like low economic growth has been, uh, has been documented in many, many different uh, indicators. And there are many explanations for why we see, like we don't see a lot of growth in, in, in the US and in, and in Europe. Um, in this kind of presentation, I'm going to uh, focus on one perspective of, uh, or I'm going to rephrase this question a bit. And I'm going to push, kind of present to you the left hand side graph, which shows the tremendous investment uh, that we've made in the US in scientific research. Um, we know, and I will explain to you a bit more today, that historically scientific research was a key driver of economic growth that allowed the US to become maybe the world's most dominant country up right after the Second World War. I think the Soviet Union also is well known, renowned for the tremendous scientific discoveries and advances they've made in the same period, like the Sputnik shock and many other things that happened. We know that science is very important and historically we had lots of economic growth to show for, for why it is so important. But what we are seeing now is it's really a stark kind of uh, puzzle, which is we have much more investment in scientific research and development today in the US. And you can see that from the left-hand side graph but there is no productivity gains. We cannot show any substantial returns to such huge investments. And this, so this is like my, our, our kind of framing of the question of what is happening? Why do we see so much research going on in the US, but much less to show for it in terms of economic performance? Uh, again, there are many explanations one can offer. Uh, we are going to offer one explanation and we have been working on this for a long time. And the explanation that we are going to offer is going to focus on how we organize innovation in the US. What is the social organization of innovation? Uh, or in other words, how the way in which our ecosystem is structured, how changes in how it is structured might explain why while we, are, while we have much more research in the US, we don't see much economic returns for it. So we are going to, to understand this question. I need to give you some context. And today I'm going to essentially describe to you uh, the history of American innovation, of the American innovation ecosystem. I'm going to show you essentially how the US organized its uh, scientific and development activities at the country level, at the society level, in the past 150 years. And then I'm going to explain to you where we are now and why we think that the changes in how we organize our economy today might have consequences uh, to inventive activity in some sectors, not in all sectors. The US is doing really well in some sectors like life sciences and ICT, but it also is performing quite badly in areas where historically the US was very, very strong at, like physics, material sciences, and even chemistry. And I want to try to link that to the changes that we've seen in the innovation ecosystem. Any questions uh, up to this point? No, not yet. <laughs> very good. So um, we can essentially characterize um, the, um, the ecosystem into three main periods, um, or actually four main periods. The first period uh, where essentially the US just started in terms of becoming an innovation power, powerhouse was 1850 to 1900s. I will not talk too much about that uh, because it's really a long time ago, but what you need to know about that period is that um, we had a very strong division of innovative labor which means we had small inventors like Edison, 
Uh, this is the age of the great, uh, the great inventors or the great independent inventors. Inventors like Edison would sit in the lab and invent uh, new things like the light bulb. And then they would license their inventions to companies like Westinghouse, for instance, uh, who would then kind of commercialize, manufacture, market, et cetera, distribute, et cetera. So there was a clear division of labor where big corporations focused on manufacturing and development and the small inventors focused on invention. Uh, universities were essentially non-existent in that period, existing, but very bad. So Harvard existed, but wasn't really good. If you want, so it wasn't very good in sciences. Uh, if you wanted to get a PhD in chemistry, you had to go to Germany uh, because you couldn't get a PhD in the UK, in, sorry, in the US in that period. So there was really very little scientific understanding of how to, how to manufacture, or oh, sorry, how to invent. Um, however, in the 1900s, uh, from 1900s to 1940, uh, there was a drastic change in how innovation was organized in the US. All these small independent inventors that dominated after, like during this, like right after the Civil War, essentially disappeared. And what we've seen, we've seen a reorganization of the innovation ecosystem from small in independent inventors into inventors working in big firms. Every large company in the US, starting in 1900s, started to essentially develop their own research lab. And what exactly this, uh, this research lab did really varies from one lab to another, but very quickly, those labs realized that in order to remain competitive, they need to, do, they need to invest in scientific research. They cannot remain competitive against the Europeans mostly, and even amongst other companies in the US, unless they develop a very deep scientific understanding of the, of the phenomena that they are developing. Now, one, let me tell you one thing which is really interesting to note. In up to like 19, up, right before the First World War, the US was the wealthiest country in the world or among the wealthiest countries, countries in the world. And the US was able to do that without, you know, without performing almost no scientific research. The way the, uh, the, European, the, the Americans did it was they essentially borrowed uh, technologies and inventions from Europe, mostly the UK, and afterwards Germany, and they specialized in mass production. Whereas the Europeans thought about mass production as being something very inferior. They wanted to do everything by hand, you know, craft, etc. And the Americans very quickly were able to take inventions from the Europeans and scale them up very quickly. And by doing that, they were able to get kind of create tremendous wealth. Well, but very quickly they realized that there is a limit to how much, how much you can profit from borrowing. And if you want to be successful in the long term, you need to understand how things work, how nature works. Uh, and this is where uh, corporate research started to develop. And we, we'll talk about that quite a bit. Uh, another thing that happened during this period, which is really interesting, is uh, from the 1900s, American universities also started to develop. So while they were still underdeveloped, they started to kind of gain some traction and improve their scientific capabilities gradually until the Second World War. Uh, the third period is what is called the golden age of corporate research. This is the best period uh, in the US if you like science. Uh, in that period, uh, we had have all the major sectors in the US realize that science is king. Science won the war, uh, the Second World War. For, uh, for America, the radar, the atom, uh, atom bomb, and many other great, great, great inventions. And after the war, there was this realization that in order to remain dominant, especially after the Sputnik shock by the Soviet Union, we have to invest in science like crazy. Uh, so the three sectors that align completely uh, to support this kind of scientific tests were the US government, that after the Sputnik shock, quadrupled or tripled the uh, Department of Defense budget. Uh, this is where like laser was invented and tons of, tons of other very important things. Uh, American corporations, the corporate labs, maybe the most famous one is Bell Labs, uh, committed themselves tremendous amount of resources to scientific research. About 14 Nobel Prizes came from uh, Bell Labs, which is a for-profit corporation and the universities that became really, really good, partly because 
the government started to fund them very heavily. So the whole ecosystem was about let's fund science. And then this stopped. This kind of thing started to change in the 80s. And in the 80s, what we are seeing, we started to see uh, essentially a system which is called division of innovative labor, where, the, where all, the sec all the sectors in the economy, the government, the corporations, and even the universities started to shift their attention more into commercial market-based applications of science. Uh, corporations maybe experience the biggest change, which is uh, to eliminate completely, and I will show you this in detail, dismantle most of the corporate research labs, these great institutions, Bell Labs, DuPont, and many others that created so much wealth early on, dismantle and kill those institutions. And companies, uh, corp big corporations in the US focus more and more and more on development and not on upstream scientific research. The government itself, after the Soviet Union collapsed, uh, really cut back on, on, on funding for scientific research and started to emphasize much more what is known as dual use technologies. Uh, they realized that in order to convince American firms to engage in scientific research, is they needed to emphasize more and more how this research can be used uh, in market applications. Maybe the best example was laser. Laser was invented in the 50s. The government funded laser. There was no commercial application for laser like up to like 1980 or the 70s for many, many, uh, for two or three decades later. And, but companies still were willing to engage because the commercial applications, the, the kind of the consumer market was not very developed. Now you cannot convince any firm, almost any firm, if you are the government, to engage in a contract that doesn't have immediate applications in the marketplace. And even universities, after the Bayh-Dole Act in 1984, started to think much more about commercial applications because during that time, with this act in 1984, uh, universities were able to were, were allowed for the first time to commercialize their inventions and make money out of the scientific discoveries. So what do we see today? We see today that science is produced by universities, development is produced by corporations, VC big firms connect universities to big firms, and governments have moved away from essentially being this great sponsor of moonshot uh, discoveries. And we argue that while this division of innovative labor might be really, really good in some sectors, uh, we also potentially have a missing middle some sectors that have essentially fallen behind uh, and not do as well. And this is what I'm going to focus on in today's presentation. Any questions or comments? Jackie, do you have anything you want to add? Uh, no, not at the moment. I think that's a great summary. You don't make any mistakes? No? Uh, Edison didn't sell his stuff to Westinghouse. He sold his telegraph patents to Western Union, but that's, we can talk yeah, about that. Yeah, I, I saw the movie as well. I know. All right, just kidding. All right, so let's move on. Uh, any more questions? Not at the moment. Okay, good. So, um, in terms of uh, in terms of the um, just show you some uh, some figures. This is for the 1850 to 1900s. What is important to note here is um, where is my one second spotlight. What is the, the only thing we want to show you here is that um, you see this graph. This graph is the share of inventions of patents that were reassigned uh, from small firms to essentially big firms to indicate how active markets for technology were uh, in the early period. In other words, there was a great division of innovative labor in the early period in the US economy where small inventors focused on doing on inventing, not really research, but more like inventions. Edison was not a great researcher, he was a great inventor. And then licensing that or selling it to, to big firms. Uh, this one is the US, this, this is the US and the, and the, and the dark bar is, is the UK. And you can see how much more active markets were in the US. Um, so here I want to really read to you uh, the kind of early view of the uh, of a very kind of, of AT&T about invent about organizing research and development inside firms. And the reason this is like one of the most funny 
quotes we can we can find is because uh, like 50 years later, AT&T became the poster child of great corporate labs in the world, uh, leading not only to great inventions like the transistor, the semiconductors, the laser, partly, and others, but also to many Nobel Prizes, about 40 Nobel, Nobel Prizes. Uh, JK can correct me if, uh, if, it's less, if it's less than 14. Yeah, it is 14. Correct me again. It's 14? All right, good. So let me kind of read it out loud. I'm fully convinced that it has never, is not now, and never will pay commercially to keep an establishment of professional inventors or of men who shift businesses to invent. This was the, this is what, this was the perspective up to like the 1900s where research was, which makes sense because the Americans just borrowed the stuff from the Europeans. Like surprisingly what the Japanese did to the Americans and the Chinese did to the Americans and you know, we did the same thing to the Europeans. And, and, it, and it didn't make any sense that companies in the US should pay money for research. We can get it for free, right? But uh, things changed uh, quite uh, drastically in 1900s. Uh, I will not go into detail on why, unless you want to know, unless there are specific questions, just to be mindful of time. But I would just say that one of the key reasons was uh, the rise of the, of the Antitrust Sherman Act in the uh, end of the 20th century, which made it much more complicated and difficult for companies to buy other companies, which means if companies wanted to grow, they had to grow organically. Other things which I think are important is uh, the scale of invention really increased. Uh, you needed more resources and, in the, and small inventors could not really uh, fund everything themselves. And also some of the inventions became more complicated technically, which required essentially agglomeration and concentration of specialists from different, different areas in, 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 one, in one lab. And here you can see on this side, this is the, uh, the first uh, corporate lab in the US, I think. I think it's the first uh, GE's uh, kind of uh, laboratory by Steinmetz. Steinmetz who was the first uh, head of the lab. And later on, like 20 years later, you can see the main figures of the time, the heads and the leaders of corporate science in the US. Um, and you know, there, there, have been, there have been many books about, about these labs and why they emerge and what did they do? And we are writing papers on this now. So I can give you a whole lecture just on that, but I will not be tempted unless there are questions. What we need to know is a major transformation in the innovation ecosystem the small inventors disappeared. We moved to organize everything in-house. No more markets for technology. We are, not going, we are not buying and selling. One company does everything. And maybe the most important thing is that companies realize in the US that they needed to understand science to be competitive. And again, many examples, but unless there are specific questions, I will, I will, push, I will push, push ahead. So just to Aaron, give some... we, we, we have a couple of questions. Uh, the question from Alexei, how do you compare economic growth with the number of recent high-tech multi-millionaires and billionaires in the US and other countries? I think this is a really interesting question. I don't want to say that the US is not doing well because it's wrong. I think the US as a country is doing really well. I think there are some sectors that get all the benefits and some sectors are left behind. And I think that in order for us as a country to be competitive and to essentially be dominant in the future, we need to address uh, those sectors that currently uh, are not doing well. And there are no millionaires in the sectors. All the millionaires come from IT, ICT, et cetera. I know, Sergey, that you are funding those companies of the internet, et cetera. But historically, the moonshots and the big, big bets that really paid off where uh, we don't see any, almost, we see very little investment in those fields. And let me, let me just give you an example. Uh, DuPont, okay, DuPont maybe it's a bit less because this was like uh, plastic and, uh, and polymers, which was which were very successful for DuPont, but maybe a bit less, uh, less impactful uh, on humanity, but definitely AT&T. AT&T, the invention of the, of the semiconductor, the invention of the transistor, uh, the inventions of the internet clearly, and uh, all these inventions, if you, actually I can, I can show you um, a picture of these guys. Look at, look at all these Nobel Prizes coming from, uh, of, from labs in, in corporate science. All of them are from physics. Physics. 
And it makes sense because physics was a, the kind of backbone of all the greatest inventions that made America great, going to the moon, uh, developing the computers, material sciences, um, everything that we have now comes from a better understanding of, of, of the atom, of, of physics. Now there is very little investment in that, but this is what, the, what America became really dominant on. And I would be really curious to know whether the Soviet Union is still, which, which is also great in physics. Actually, JK is writing his PhD dissertation about the effect of Soviet science on American startups. And, and it's really amazing today that all these great investments that corporations done, have done in, in, in the field of physics and material sciences, et cetera, those fields are essentially dead today, which are, and these fields are critical for clean energy and for computer, quantum computing and, and electronics and everything that we believe made us great. I don't think we need more Facebooks and more Amazons, to be honest. We need more physics and better understanding of nature if we want to remain uh, dominant uh, in the future. Uh, but this is a bit of uh, me jumping ahead a bit. Uh, okay, so was another question? Uh, yes, yeah, so sort of building on all those uh, influences uh, from from Russia on on Elon Musk and and the rocket uh, uh, competition. So the question from Dmitry Tsvetkov was like Tesla question mark. Probably, can you comment on on Tesla and how your research can? Um, so, uh, so it's a great great question. Uh, my comment on Tesla, that. yeah, I think is uh, um, I'm not I'm not sure Tesla is really innovating as much itself. I think uh, in my opinion, again, I'm not an expert on Tesla, but I think it's mostly boring technologies and science that is performed in other places. I don't think Tesla is, I think I think about Tesla more like of an Apple, uh, a great design company that integrates technology coming from the outside. So I will not compare Tesla, I mean, I'll show you an example for you in a second. Um, I'm going to go back to it in a second. We just gonna finish this slide. I think this slide shows you that in 1940, Look at the size of engineers and scientists working in American labs. And if we go, if we kind of jump ahead for a second, like if you look at GM, GM actually did research uh, back in the 50s and 40s and before, and they had electric vehicles back, back in the day. They didn't commercialize them, but they had it. Uh, and they really did the research themselves. I don't think uh, Tesla is doing a lot of research. Maybe I'm wrong, maybe I'm not an expert and I would, I would, love, it. I would, love, I would love to be corrected. But I would not compare Tesla to to the same uh, to the same big corporations we have we've had in the past. Uh, AT and T Lab, you see this most famous lab that we've had. Now it's dead; it doesn't exist anymore. Um, again, tremendous success. Zero Park doesn't exist anymore, and this was the birth of Apple, Microsoft, and many many other great inventions and discoveries. Use Research Lab the laser uh, aviation, tremendous inventions as well. IBM still alive, now mostly about AI. And DuPont, DuPont is a poster child of research. DuPont is like, is, is well known for a section of DuPont which is called Purity Hall. And the reason it was called Purity Hall because research was so pure and uncontaminated by, by commercial reason, commercial applications of commercial motivation. This is also gone, all this stuff has completely sold and dismantled in 2016 by some activist investors. So going back two slides. Okay, so 1940, what happened in 1940? I told you before, World War II, uh, science then its frontier. The US realized that, um, that we, science won the war. And now as I, as I explained earlier, everything is about science in the US. We have all these uh, labs, the government, the universities are rising, everything is great until the Soviet Union collapses. And then, I, from, in my opinion, this is the main reason. Or one of the key reasons, we, I, I tend to argue with this a lot with my co-authors, and we can talk about why this happened. But um, we show that from the 1980s, etc., we see a collapse in the ecosystem big corporations started to focus much more on downstream invention. And you can see this uh, red line. This is essentially a line showing an increase in patenting activity. They publish much less in scientific articles. And this is based on kind of patenting and publication activity. Uh, this graph is simply based on surveys uh, from NSF, National Science Foundation. 
where, um, where uh, companies are asked, how much do you spend on research and how much on development? And you see what happened to the share of, of investment in research really dropped by a third. So those pictures, different methods point in the same direction. Um, yeah, okay, so one obvious uh, potential explanation for why science became less important, uh, why companies invested less in science might be that science maybe is not important anymore. So what we show you here on this slide, this slide essentially is a measure, I will not go into detail unless you really want to know how we do this, but it's a measure of how much inventions actually build on science. And you see that the inventions tend to cite science more and more over time. So it's not that companies stop investing in science because they don't need to use it. Actually, uh, there are different reasons. It's not that it's not useful. Um, this graph on the right-hand side is really important because what it shows, this is based on a statistical analysis of how the stock market of companies respond to uh, how much companies invest in research. And you can see that from 1980 to 1992, this kind of uh, this bar indicates that if you double, if you increase by 100% uh, investment in research, the market value of the firm rises by 10%. And patenting was actually negative. In the second half of the sample, there was essentially no relationship anymore between the value of a firm and the scientific research the firm performed. In other words, investors and the stock market stop valuing scientific capabilities inside firms at all. And the question is, how can we reconcile all these kind of changes? The fact that corporations are becoming more kind of more uh, invention oriented, invest less in scientific research. Stock market don't like scientific, scientific research anymore, but at the same time, uh, science is continuing to be important. So I'm going to say, this is a big question and Clearly there are some ways that we can rationalize that. But just to put more meat on this stuff, I want to go back because I think that sometimes, how can I go back? Oops, one second. In other words, all these great institutions are dead. Okay, if you don't believe my numbers, these great institutions no longer exist with the exception maybe of a bit of version of IBM Watson lab. And these are a small number of the labs that we had. We had way more. It's a, it's a real big thing that happened. But maybe it's because they invested too much in research and less in commercialization. Yeah, so now you sound like my advisor, my, my, my colleague, <laughs> uh, my senior colleague. So my senior, this is a great point. So this is a list, a laundry list of things. Let me tell you what my, let me tell you what my colleague, and I believe to be true. Now I'm convinced, exactly as you said. So. Uh, we might think that capitalism, the capitalist system, always will always push uh, institutions and corporations and, and different players in the ecosystem to specialize because specialization is efficiency. This is what Adam Smith, the father of capitalism, taught us. So we always look for more and more and more specialization, cutting back on slack um, and, and essentially the way we kind of move and connect different special that different specialized uh, systems or sectors in the economy is, is kind of through institutions to market for technology, strong patent protection, etc. Uh, but the big question is why didn't we specialize from the beginning, right? Why didn't we specialize from day one? So the thing is that at the beginning, you know, we wanted to specialize, we wanted companies to do just development and let the universities do the science, but there were no universities. So corporations had to replace the missing institution of scientific research because it didn't exist. So they had to do it themselves. And then universities developed, but then the government, you know, started to really get involved in, in, in the US economy after the Second World War. And they said, look, we don't care about profits. We care about beating the Soviets and being the best empire in the world. And we want to harness science, not for profits, but for geopolitical dominance. So the profit motive also kind of a push to the side and corporations were essentially forced into, forced, I mean like not really forced, but pulled into an ecosystem where uh, specialization was not important. But now, and this is the key, I think the key, uh, the key 
conclusion we reach is now we are actually converging into a system that is very consistent with capitalism, a system where companies care about downstream innovation and commercialization and things that can monetize and things that can value. Universities specialize in doing science. Uh, VC-backed companies specialize in connecting science done by universities and, 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 and development done by firms. And the government kind of take a stand back and just helps when it needs when it, when it needs to help when the markets kind of underperform a bit. Uh, so we believe that that what we are seeing now is what we should see in a capitalist economy. We should not look back and feel sad for essentially the golden age of research because it wasn't natural. What is natural in our system is what we have now, and we should spend our energy not in learning and yearning about the past, but thinking how we can make the present better by not trying to go back into a system that was more integrated, but by how can, we, how can we support the existing system with better institutions and better government policies that are really targeted towards the areas that did not perform well in this new system. Any questions? I guess, uh, uh, yeah, the follow-up question from, from Alexei. It looks like the government and not corporates is the best RNG investor. So the well, government, uh -huh. yeah, the government did play a very okay. JK, why don't you take this question? What do you think? So this is a very kind of controversial question. Yeah, the government is the best investor in science. What do you think? So I think this really depends um, depends on the tech type of technology investments that we're talking about. Um, certainly, uh, the fruits of basic scientific research are uncertain and very wide, and therefore a social planner or a public uh, body would be sort of best suited, best incentivized to um, sort of invest in basic research. Having said that, it's also true that the capabilities to choose and pick the winners in um, these R&D contests um, does not reside always within uh, governmental bodies. Now, right after the Second World War, there was this very happy marriage between industry and um, sort of the Department of Defense and the um, early sort of uh, early sort of scientific organizations, federal scientific organizations, such that they knew which scientific sectors were ripe for progress, such as lasers, such as solid state electronics and, and, and um, nuclear physics also. Um, I, I don't think we have enough information in the modern period, whether that still remains the case. So this is a very long winded answer to say that it really depends. I, I would add one thing to Jake's uh, point, which is, Maybe, maybe governments are, actually no, I think government can be really important in some sectors, but you also need the right system to incentivize companies to kind of to, to collaborate with the government. I just read this amazing book called Stealth. You know what Stealth is? It's like the stealth plane. You know, like the, the plane that kind of flies and cannot be detected. Mm -hmm. by the stealth technology. Device. The stealth, yeah. beautiful. Mm -hmm. There are the book called Stealth, if you want to say. You know that the, the uh, so the U.S. government wanted to essentially fight the Soviet, fight, but to uh, to essentially uh, um, be undetected by Soviet radars. So they had this competition, and do you know where the science came from that essentially allowed for the invention of the stealth? It came from a Soviet scientist from Siberia who yeah. came up with this theory of of uh, radar diffraction, of sorry, of uh, of radio wave uh, diffraction. But the U.S. government didn't know what to do with it. Sorry, the the, the uh, Soviet Union government did not know what to do with it because they didn't have a strong enough capitalist uh, system that essentially provided incentives for co for corporations to find ways to monetize and find applications for this for these inventions. So what the Americans did was to translate all these kind of journals from Russians to English, and a company called uh, North Pole. Uh, essentially identified this theory and for 10 years developed a very deep understanding of the theory and its applications and at the end they developed the, the stealth. Now the question that you need to ask yourself is why didn't the Russians develop the stealth? And I think because they didn't have the kind of private sector 
to interact with the US, with, with the Soviet government. And this is one one thing I wanted to add to JK's to JK's point. But it's a very important question. We are working on this now, uh, and we hope to get to give a more a better answer in the future. So these changes can be the result of many things. Uh, I will not go in detail on what these are um, because we covered the, the kind of the main ones. One one thing I would say is. Now we have great universities, so maybe it makes sense that now that we can we have great universities, we should not spend as much resources on internal science. Um, but this is again a question which is open. We are going to address it in, in a few minutes. Sharon, there is another question, uh, sort of uh, building up on the whole discussion between government and and, and private investments into research. So. Natalia is asking, there is a difference between long-term and short-term scientific research. Companies never invest in research that give long-term 50 years result, results, how to overcome it. Well, I would, I would add like, do we need to overcome that? Yeah, so let, okay, this is a great question. Can I, can, I, can, I push, can I push back and kind of, so let me kind of go very quickly on this, on those slides, because this is a really important question. And this is, this is what like we want to talk about in depth and I have like 20 minutes. So, I'm going to push back because I have slides on that question in, in a few minutes. So Thanks. all these slides essentially say, now we have a system where we have specialization, companies do development, universities do research, and how do we connect it to? We have a very active market for technology like we had in the 1850s and 1900s. Uh, lots of contracts, licensing, alliances, joint ventures, uh, agreements between firms. Uh, there is one difference between the system today and how it used to be in the past, which is in the past, the division was between small inventors and big farms. None of them really did science. Now the system is really about universities doing science, upstream scientific work. VC backed firms commercialize this work and make them more applicable and big corporations focus on, uh, on invention and manufacturing. The best example of that is life sciences where we have essentially universities kind of develop the molecules, uh, the VC back firms develop it into a small firm. This is then licensed, maybe sometimes directly from the university to the big firm that specializes on manufacturing and marketing and clearly going through the clinical trials, which is, a not, which is not a scientific process, but a very daunting and complex process uh, notwithstanding. Okay, so this is what I wanted to say about, about that. Uh, this is a bit essentially less important. And now I want to talk to you about the question that uh, I think Natalia or uh, that, uh, sorry, that you asked before. Okay, so what is the problem in the system that we have now? And JK, do you want to uh, take this part? Because you are, I want to give you some experience also presenting these ideas. Do you want to present this idea? Why, why we might think that we have a problem? Let me just unmute myself. Yeah, sure. So I think so far what Sharon has presented is, is, is that there is a missing middle of um, corporate research that we're not, um, that, that is preventing basic science from being translated into sort of commercial products. And that might be happening in sort of, um, because of two uh, reasons. The first is that, um, Corporate research in large firms um, is sort of qualitatively different from what, what happens in universities and what happens in VC-backed uh, small firms or startups. Um, and there are three reasons for, for that, for which I believe there are, there, are, um, there are slides for this. And we can talk about the gap being bigger in complex product industries. Um, the basic, uh, later as well, uh, the basic idea uh, behind that is that because there is a complex sort of handoff process between the basic science to the intermediate science towards the applied technology and finally to the product. Um, if, if we divide this process, it becomes much harder to translate new science into products if you have a fragmented system. And especially so if the scientific process itself is more complex. And by complex, I mean um, sectors like the energy sector um, uh, we just had a talk about, we just had a question about Tesla. The, the biggest, one of the biggest problems that um, electric vehicles have um, is actually hooking up the, um, the 
whole EV system to the grid, um, getting a uh, good enough battery that will last um, hundreds of miles. Um, all, all of these um, are different sort of technological sectors that need to be coordinated in the same time. Um, so for instance, I think Panasonic was the first firm that was incentivized to come into gig the Gigafactory and to actually develop the, um, uh, the battery cells for the um, initial Tesla models. So there's a lot of sort of coordination that already goes, uh, that needs to happen for these complex in industries to capitalize on new science. Um, so moving on to the difference um, between sort of large uh, corporate science and sort of um, what we have right now, which is a fragmented system, we can turn to a case study in AI research. And the specific case study we have in mind is the introduction of neural network models into the um, into Google or Alphabet's uh, research portfolio. And we know that AI research has been going on for quite some time um, since the 1990s, but uh, corporations really took um, a an interest in this technology circa 1995 um, and, and 2000, when they um, discovered that this technology could be used in a number of applications within their within their um, within their uh, business areas. I believe. Um, so, so corporate research has really been rising, if you can see at the uh, upper left-hand side since 2006 um, uh, in really leading machine learning journals. And the share of sort of corporate publications um, on the upper right-hand side has also been really um, increasing uh, over this time. And we know that these research uh, subjects were the, this, the type of research that was being done at Google was actually different from the research being done at uh, top universities like the University of Toronto and so forth um, from a specific project that they did for neural networks. And that was for the patch of the Google Translate system. Um, this case study shows us that um, that uh, corporate research um, is more interdisciplinary. As you can see, the paper that um, was at the behind the Google Translate system uh, had many more authors than uh, there are typically in uh, corporate, uh, sorry, in university research papers. Um, we've done a very quick sort of quantitative analysis of um, corporate versus university research um, papers in the leading machine learning journals. And what we find is that on average, uh, corporate research papers have uh, more uh, co-authors um, than university uh, research papers, which is a very uh, crude um, sort of measure of measure, but uh, a measure uh, nonetheless of the interdisciplinarity of corporate research. Um, the middle, sorry, can we go back to the, yeah, so um, the, the two other sort of uh, features of corporate research that separated from um, this fragmented system um, are that it is more sort of um, that firms have more um, complementary assets, meaning they have manufacturing skills, they have um, all sorts of different kinds of applied research personnel that they can use that um, university uh, researchers usually don't have. And one of the examples of that is that um, when Google was doing this patch on the Google Translate system, they actually came up with um, what's called a tensor processing unit, which is a uh, sort of specific made um, custom purpose uh, processor that does sort of these very crude matrix, mul mul matrix multiplications very quickly so that um, it's, it's optimized for algorithms like neural networks. And this really um, was a game changer when it came to sort of doing these sorts of um, AI ML tasks. Um, the final thing that I would say, and, and this sort of um, sort of chip processing technology really wouldn't be uh, readily at hand in, in university um, 
environments. The final thing I would say is that um, this sort of technology is really architectural and therefore um, large and diversified firms like Alphabet would be sort of best incentivized to use it. Google not only uses neural networks on their Google Translate platform, but also they started using it for, I mean, the initial uses were for filtering spam in, in Google Mail, but also in, in autonomous vehicles, um, Waymo is, is a prime example of that. And also um, in cooling their data centers, their, their, their servers, um, they, they use the new technology for, from, I believe, um, their deep mind acquisition from Dennis has, has to this a, a couple of years ago. So those are the three things that I would say about corporate research. Um, well, Sherman, you, do you want to take this one? Yeah, this is really great. So let me just jump in for like, just to kind of say one last thing and then we can take questions. Um, so we think we have a missing middle. We, we think that the system we, we have now in the US is doing really well in some sectors. And, and less so in others. The sectors that the US is doing really well is life sciences uh, and ICT. I don't think we, I, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I do not think we, can, we should say or think that our system cannot find long-term research. I think it's a wrong presumption. Going back to the question that was asked before, because if you think about life sciences, the markets in the US are funding CRISPR, which is a very long-term scientific venture that we don't really do gene editing, you know, you don't really know whether it's going to work, etc. But the market is very patient. Uh, the market is very patient on many, many dimensions in terms of when the profits will arise. Uh, at the same time, the market is doing really well by funding um, Tesla is one example, but uh, clearly uh, many companies in IT as again as well. And but it's doing a horrible job funding, as I said before, companies in material sciences, which are which is critical to make any advances in computing. We need better materials, clean energy, nothing, no, nothing, no, nothing, but nothing uh, of, that, of that sort. Uh, chemistry, uh, physics, as I said before. Um, and the question is why? And let me just kind of just finish today's talk with, by, by planting an idea in your mind. And this idea is growing in, in kind of popularity in the US. Uh, and the idea is very simple, and it goes back to the to the to the, part, to the question and the role of the government, as you mentioned before. The mark, if you think about again, and Sergey, you, you you know this well. There are two types of risk when you invest in a company. You essentially uh, you face two types of risks. The first risk is technical success. I invest. I'm investing in gene editing. Will this work? I'm investing in a coronavirus vaccine. Will this work? And the other one is commercial success. If it works, would anybody want it? Now, in life sciences, if you have a coronavirus vaccine, you know there is a market for it, you know? There's no, no commercial risk. The only risk you have is technical risk. If you invest in AI or internet stuff, there is very little technical risk. The big risk is, will it work? Will people pay money for it? If you're investing in Uber or any other business model, the only problem you have is, will my, will my business model work? There is no technical risk associated with that. And what we find, we find that our ecosystem is doing really well in funding projects that have only one type of risk, either technical or commercial. If you have both types of risks, this is where we see a breakdown. And material science, the best example is the laser. Uh, the laser is, uh, and Jackie knows this well, because he actually wrote a case study on that. Uh, laser was a technology that nobody really know, knew how to do in the early 50s, how to make it work. Uh, it was very difficult to make it work. And even when you make it work, it's really hard to know how it is, like, what, it, what, it, what, it, what it is useful for. When the US government funded it, they essentially had in mind, essentially a laser beam that would kill uh, 50 soldiers in one beam, like many, many miles away. So actually the test they gave uh, Mr. Gold was the first guy, well, not, like, not just like the business model they wanted is they said, can you kill a cow 10,000 uh, feet away with a laser beam? And the guy said, yes, and they gave him lots of money. Actually, he asked for $300,000, he got a million dollars in 1950, in the 50s. Um, so the government, the role of the government is actually is, is in mitigating what is called commercial risk. The government says, you focus on the science, we're going to buy it from you. Uh, this is really important for inventions and ventures that have both technical uncertainty and commercial uncertainty. 
And these are exactly what we see in between. And this is a big problem in the US. And many, many kind of the different policies and different approaches of how we can help incentivize and support ideas that might be risky technically and ideas that even if they are successful, they are not certain how they're, how they're going to be used and change our lives. But if you think about it for a second, these are exactly the big ideas, the big moonshots that make America great. Clearly there are benefits in medicine and clearly there are benefits in, in business models, but the big life-changing events happen when we invested in stuff that we did not know whether they're going to work and we didn't know exactly how they're going to use them. And this is what our ecosystem is missing now. Now we can ask, another question is why? What's the problem with funding? Like said, why can't you find why can't you find a startup that uh, is both technically difficult and commercially I cannot tell you now exactly how it's going to make money? We can discuss. And the growing kind of idea in the US is that it's difficult to make this to fund those projects is because even Sergey specializes. Even people like Sergey in the VC business, they tend to specialize more and more narrowly and they keep investing in stuff that was successful in the past. And if you specialize as an investor, then it's much more difficult for you to try and assess things that you have not seen before, things that require and that have not only a technical difficulty, but also a difficulty in terms of how things will be applied if they're successful. But this is, I think, a bit, uh, a bit pushing it beyond what I, what I wanted to do. I, I could just say one thing, there is a really interesting book about this point by uh, Josh Lerner from Harvard Business School, who essentially make the point that this is uh, becoming more and more specialized and this is a problem, potential problem, and this is a good complement for the kind of work that we are doing as well. Um, and that's it. So I think the US is great. I think the ecosystem we have now has evolved in a very natural way, consistent with capitalism. But I also think that we have some sectors that are suffering and we can look back at our history in the US to learn that sometimes governments can be really helpful and sometimes, as JK explained, companies can do things better than universities. And with that, I would like to conclude and thank you very much and take questions for now. I know we don't have much time, but I, I can stay a few minutes later if, if needed. Yeah. Thank you very much, Sharon. Uh, we do have questions. So I'll ask a couple of questions and then I turn to uh, Dmitry Svetkov question. Uh, but I want to begin with your advice to startups from, from Russia, Eastern Europe, Western Europe, like which sector to target with their new ventures, where they would be more successful, profitable. So JK is doing his PhD on, the, on essentially the effect of Soviet science on American innovation. I think that the last thing you should try and do is be like the US. Don't be like American firms, we have enough. Uh, I would let JK respond because his PhD dissertation is on how, how Soviet immigrants coming to the US have, were able to shape innovation in the US by providing science, deep science that was understood in the Soviet Union, but less so in the US. Uh, Jackie, do you want to comment on that? So just so that I understand, is the question... Um... Forget about the question, just comment on, on it. We don't have time, just comment. I think it's really important people know what you find in your research, in your dissertation. It, it would be the best way to answer the question. So the ground truths from, from the findings that I have from, from my dissertation research is that it's undeniable that um, scientists from the Soviet, the erstwhile, the former Soviet Union have contributed to the US innovation ecosystem. And mainly um, their contributions have been in ICT, um, but not limited to that. Their biggest contributions were in laser physics. And I believe that was where the Soviet Union had actually working prototypes of, of their pro products. The, the influence becomes a little more diffuse as you go into the information and communication parts of, of ICT. And I believe that has to do with the fact that the Soviet computer industry back in the 80s was actually uh, quite backward. Um, software programming, uh, for instance, in the 80s in the Soviet Union was not um, 
hot as it were, as, as it was in Silicon Valley. And therefore, where my, my prognosis right now is that Soviet physicists actually ended up working on the chemistry, the surface chemistry and the physics behind uh, designing uh, semiconductor chips rather than designing um, software or, or, or the hardware themselves. Um, so, so that's, that's one. Um, well, just to build on that, uh, Jackie, we don't have much time. I think this is a great point. So if you ask me, I think we should identify the areas that the US ecosystem is not doing well in, in, in essentially in supporting research. And I can give you tons of examples, but the examples are usually the ones that we discussed, like physics and material sciences, uh, clean energy. This is a, these are places where small firms in the US cannot get sufficient support from the ecosystem. And this is where essentially a company that comes uh, with some solutions, with some mitigation, some mitigation of risk, technical risk mostly, can be very successful. So this is what I would encourage you to think about. Uh, there are enough internet companies in the US and there are enough life sciences companies in the US, but we have a huge opportunity in between that is currently, I think our ecosystem is not serving well. And we can talk more about that and there are really interesting examples and interesting uh, kind of um, uh, an interesting potential kind of uh, agencies and even even university programs that are trying to help entrepreneurs in those areas maybe soviet maybe the soviet firms or the russian firms already sorted this out and can essentially capitalize on this kind of uh, missing link or missing or, or this void in my opinion so the quick advice is go look into old inventions in the Soviet Union, some patents, some prototypes in, uh, in physics and chemistry and, and try to apply it uh, to well, your own. It doesn't have to be all, it doesn't have to be all. I'm, I'm just telling you one thing. If you are a startup in the US, and I can give you many examples, if you don't have time, tons of examples, and you have a great uh, kind of uh, innovation that is based on physics science or material science or chemistry, it's really hard for you to get funding and support in the US. Maybe you can get it in Russia from governments and be successful there because clearly there is tons of demand for this kind of innovation. This is the future. But you will, if you come to the US, you will see much less competition from American firms than if, than if you come in the areas of either life sciences or ICT. This is what I'm saying. And the Soviets have a great, tremendous uh, historical uh, leadership in those spaces. I can tell you this because I read this story a lot and I can give you many examples of that. Uh, mm -hmm. So this is the opportunity, linking kind of sciences in those domains into applications, something that in the US we don't do well enough. Mm -hmm. So a question from Dmitry, he, he makes a statement that uh, from his opinion, biotech and pharma are really underperforming in comparison with computer science and IT industry. Any comments on whether this is going to reverse soon? Yeah, so this is a big question. And there has been, people have been talking about it for, for, for 20 years. I don't believe this is true, uh, but this is based mostly on, on anecdotal evidence. I think we are making tremendous uh, advances in life sciences. Um, just look at, look now how quickly we're going to have, hopefully have a vaccine, right? Uh, we could not have achieved that 10, 20 years ago. So I do not buy this argument. I think it just takes longer and we need to be patient. This is my opinion. Okay, and the comment about the, the Google case, uh, there is a legislation in US that bans foreign uh, owners of startups that are focusing on AI. Uh, what are the reasons and whether this uh, stopping innovations or not. So I'm not familiar with this ban. JK, are, are you familiar with this law? No, I think it's actually, uh, I'm not familiar with this one. So I, I, I'm, I don't believe this is true. I'd be shocked. Maybe in some areas like defense, but I don't think that, I, I, I'd be surprised if this, is, if, this, if this statement is accurate. Maybe there are some limitations on how it is applied in some areas, but I think you can easily be do AI as a foreign country, in the, as a foreign company in the US. I, I again, I'm not an expert, but this is my opinion. I, I, I'd be surprised if, if you cannot be an AI company in the US and owned by 
um, by a different, by foreign entity. But again, I do not know. This is just based on my, my, my knowledge. Mm -hmm. And traditional question about Google. I remember many, many years ago, you were arguing that um, Google is in a bad shape because the the share price implies the huge growth factor and and the competition is really fierce and you are like uh, click away to to switching from Google to any anything else and and our classmate actually divested from from Google like right after his lecture. Uh, uh, despite of that. So what do you think about uh, Google prospects and whether your opinion about Google has changed throughout those years? So I think what is really interesting about Google is that is their reorganization is alphabet. And I have the whole lecture where I can maybe do next time where we can essentially, where we essentially explain that this reorganization was a way to support Google's uh, moonshot initiatives, very kind of, um, kind of, of the moonshot, like very ambitious innovation initiatives. Um, and the thing is the market did not like that Google invested in those areas. Uh, and to overcome those challenges from the market, Google reorganized itself as Alphabet uh, and organized those different companies as separate firms uh, as a way to relax some of the pressure from the market. Um, it's really interesting. I can, I can tell you one thing because we don't have time and I can tell you one thing, okay, about that. Apple almost invests nothing in research and development, nothing, very, very little. Look at the projects by Apple, not very impressive. And the market loves it. And actually Apple is very proud that they're worth so much money by doing so much little innovation. Now, I also looked at all the research projects by Google, and it's amazing. It's like incredible. That's so, so innovative. But the market doesn't like it so much. It doesn't, the market doesn't want to support all this R&D. And this is like the key story, I think, that really, you kind of really need to think about. Um, why the market loves a company like Apple that does no R&D, but pushes and always kind of struggles to value Google that is trying to do so many things which are going to be great for humanity. Um, and I think it, in part, it relates to the story that we told now where the market wants companies to specialize and not have these different kind of programs inside, but at the same time, uh, visionaries like Bing, Page, uh, and Elon Musk and many others think that the market might be wrong and they're very short-term oriented and they don't take into account the big long benefit that can come from, from investing in this kind of research project. So I do not know what I think about Google. I can tell you that the market doesn't value the research projects that Google does as much. And to what extent, to the extent that markets are right or Britain and Page are right, it's still an open question. Um, I think most of the money that Google makes still comes from advertising. So the same conclusion I, I gave you like many years ago, I think still applies. It's still an advertising company. Even, the, even though they've invested so much money in all these other moon charts, I don't think they had any big success. Look at Tesla. Tesla is one of the like Fortune 500. Uh, I think Google invested potentially the same amount of time in autonomous cars. And clearly they were not able to do anything significant with it right with the way more. So to the extent that the market is right and what we want is essentially more specialized companies or whether a company like Google can do things better, better, I think it's still an open question. But if you ask me what the evidence suggests, I think the evidence suggests the market is right. You want to specialize and you want to carve out uh, those moon, char moon charts outside of Google and let Google be a an advertising company. And if Google is an advertising company, then it's not really, it's not really exciting as much. This is why this is kind of my 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 long winded uh, view. JK, anything you want to add, JK? No, I, I think that covers covers it. Okay, and maybe the last question about the uh, the Google case study. In the case study, they invented the chip to to better perform the spam filters. Don't you think that 
those corporate innovations, even if they're in a deep tech, in the cheap innovation, they're sort of uh, shallow in its applications. Sorry, is, is the question that the science may be very deep, but the application is very shallow? Yeah. Um, that may well be the case. Um, so I guess the question is getting at science does, I think the question is getting at the fact that science sometimes doesn't pay off that well. Um, but I think that really depends on the time frame you're, you're looking at, because initially um, these um, these new innovations were applied for spam filters, but nowadays it's, it's being used in autonomous uh, vehicles as well. Um, I can give you another example for, for DuPont um, that they came up with the with nylon. The science behind nylon was extremely complicated. It was cutting edge polymer chemistry um, during the 1930s that US universities really weren't really engaging in at all. But in the end, what they ended up was with was basically ladies hosiery, uh, you know, underwears um, made out of nylon. Um, but after the, the fact of the matter is that because they had that scientific capability um, within the firm, they were able to then continue to innovate on new and broader and more important products um, such as Kevlar, polyurethane, plastics in general, Anything that has to do with colloids, um, they are able to sort of be at first and sort of um, capitalize on that. If they were only tinkering with like one invention like the nylon and only doing applied science work on, you know, uh, underwear alone, then they would never have been able to do all the following inventions that, that happened afterwards. And I think that's what a lot of these um, uh, sort of ICT firms really recognize is that having that absorption capacity within the firm is really important, not just for inventing things, but also keeping pace with the front technological frontier. Um, that's that's why uh, companies like Facebook, companies like um, Uber also um, moved uh, their uh, robotics. To, basically, they bought the robotics department from Carnegie Mellon uh, because they wanted to stay ahead of um, everything that was happening on autonomous vehicles. They have a major research center that's uh, literally just uh, across the street from Carnegie Mellon. Um, so yeah, that, that will be my that will be my answer. It may seem shallow, but they they're most like they most likely have very wide applications. Yeah, that's that's the problem with with startups that develop similar technologies is that this is so wide they don't know where to run and 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 sell their technology. Just had a recent talk with the uh, great developer development team. They invented a chip that is too much uh, two times faster than the comparable Intel chip, and and I asked them like where would it be applicable they said everywhere i mean like you can mine bitcoins with that but this is yeah. like okay you you invented it just to mine bitcoins or like trade uh, uh on a stock market faster uh, but not yeah, the, I, not the breakthrough not the moonshot right exactly. and they still cannot monetize it because having these ideas you have to like go and, and, and sell to, to actually some mining farms or uh, uh, broker companies, trading exactly. companies. Exactly, I, I think that's a great point. And I think that's sort of the blessing and the curse from doing basic science research is that it's, it's so diverse and versatile that you can use it for basically everything. But if you do basically everything given a budget constraint, it means that you're doing nothing. And when it, I, I think that's where the market is kind of missing in that it's not intermediating the, the handoff of that technology to, to the user um, efficiently. Um, and I, I suppose that what the large firms were able to do in the 40s, 50s, and 60s was to figure out of use for new inventions. And I think the prime example is laser in this case also because the laser was invented in the 1960s but their sort of major use really didn't come until the ICT revolution happened in the 90s. 
And guess where they were used? They were used in fiber optic links. Fiber optic links wouldn't uh, work until you could actually figure out the physics, uh, the chemistry behind um, silica gels. So if you don't have sort of the optical links that, that are able to transmit the laser, the laser is useless. You, you can't transmit any information um, because you can't transmit it over um, the atmosphere as you can do with microwaves uh, or, or, or radio. So um, they, you need tremendous patience, tremendous trial and error to actually get to a working prototype. And that's where perhaps the larger firms with a long, long term view as we stylize them uh, would be would be better suited for it. But as Sharon said, we're not in that system anymore. So we got to make do with what we have. Yeah. Okay. Uh... The last question, and we'll write, wrap up. This is like the, the uh, ten last questions that just did together. So you know that, right? <laughs> okay. Question from Mansur. Almost every startup wants Google or Apple to buy it. Maybe not. Maybe yes. How do you think? Is it true? And is it? What's your attitude to that? I would. I would say one thing. In the past. In the past. If you had like this cool scientific technology, it was enough. Now you need to develop a business, unfortunately. I think this is what we have been moving into in the US. And I say unfortunately, because as I told you in the 1860s in the US, you, had, you could have a great idea and then sell it to a big fund to commercialize. Now it's not enough. Now you need to kind of do more and develop a business around it. And which means you can specialize less because now you have to do more activities. But I would say if you want to be attractive, have customers, be a bit stronger and show that you are a threat. And now, now there is this big, big kind of criticism against big firms, uh, which is called like killer acquisitions. Companies buy, big companies buy startups to kill them because they're afraid they will go too big and, uh, and essentially jeopardize their position. So if you want to be acquired, I think the consensus today or, or growing consensus is that you need to essentially be a threat to an, to an important part of Google's uh, business. And to be a threat, you need to build a business. You cannot just have a technology. You have to have more than that. And this, this is important. Killer acquisitions, lots of discussions about that today. Buying you to kill you so you don't threat, threaten me in the future. Yeah, it's a good strategy. We, we consider it for some of the startups. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, Sharon, JK, it was a great pleasure to hear your research and you answer the questions. Uh, looking forward for, for the update on your research, especially on the Soviet uh, science and it, its influence on, on US, would be very much relevant. Thank you very much. Thank you guys, thank you. It was great seeing you and I hope to catch up uh, again in not too long. Thank you very much guys. Yeah. Bye, bye bye. Thank you, JK.